So <clears throat> I'm going to try to kind of uh, talk to you about kind of what the situation is with tropical conservation. Uh, and in that I'm going to try to illustrate a little bit on my work, but a little bit also on what I think are questions that are not being addressed, that are more kind of general. So I'll kind of try to bring those questions in throughout the talk, and then I'll revisit them at the very end. And that's maybe what I consider the, kind of the, the take-home message of the, the talk and those questions. So I really want to kind of start to talk about kind of what the situation is and how things have been changing. And I want to talk about 50 years of conservation. I just wanted to start off with something that I found that was written in 1962. So uh, basically this is a, a very early account that you can really call one of the first statements of primary conservation. And you can basically read it yourself. Uh, back in 1962, we were realizing the situation was kind of, as they say, uh, precarious. And the, this uh, author basically ends by saying, Sh shall we remain unmoved by at such annihilation? And this was stated in 1962, and we'll kind of go through the talk and you can kind of think about whether or not we have been, you know, basically unmoved by the annihilation. So, uh, tropical forest can look like uh, this. This is where I work in Africa. Uh, this is Kibale National Park, and I'll talk about it a lot. I've worked there now for 28 years. Um, so it can either look like this, this is where I work in Africa, or it can look like this. This is uh, in Southeast Asia, an area that was basically just uh, deforested for the establishment of uh, palm oils. Uh, and I always like to kind of put things in perspective to start with, to make people realize maybe what's happening. Um, and so, uh, these are just some global statistics. Between the year 2000 and 2012, 2.3 million square kilometers of forest was lost globally, and in the tropics, forest loss increased at a rate of 2,100 square kilometers per year. This is uh, the picture is from uh, southern Uganda, where I work, and as you can see, one side is park and the other side is kind of human agricultural fields. And I don't know about you, I can think about what a hectare is. It's the size of a you know football field or a soccer pitch, um, but you know square kilometers start becoming a little vague when you start talking about millions of square kilometers. I'm totally lost. So Canada is 10 million square kilometers. So you can kind of think about what that number of 2.3 million square kilometers means in 12 years. And this is really kind of what I want to make my kind of first more general point. And this is a uh, something that's been called shifting baselines. Why do we see comparisons made to the year 2012? What's magic about 2012? Like 2000. Uh, so why do we make comparisons back to 2000 rather than back to 1962 or 50 years ago? The answer probably is we have uh, you know satellite images, so we use that as a as a reference point. But that starts basically setting a baseline. And the idea of shifting baselines is that in every generation they take what they kind of see. So I take when I went out to the field when I was basically a postdoc to Africa, and I saw, okay, this is the baseline, this is okay. And then you kind of fight to keep it at okay. But then I've seen my students come along and basically accept the second baseline. And if their students come along and accept another baseline, uh, <clears throat> where I'm working basically it's always shifting down what you think is as okay. So kind of shifting baselines is something that I think we rarely think about, uh, and those sorts of statistics that is what kind of permeate the literature and permeate our policy actions um, is really in some ways very biased. To think about things over, over time and kind of also to shifting baselines, this is uh, <coughs> just a kind of simple search I did for this uh, talk, which is basically the number of publications on Google Scholar. So I just put in, you know, primate conservation, the quotations, and search each year to find out what was done. And this just shows kind of the shifting in emphasis on primate conservation. So when I went through grad school, it was starting to become you know, something of interest. But it really wasn't uh, something that people were talking about. We really almost had almost kind of exponential growth lately, and people are really, really now interested in it. So there's been a shift in what we kind of think about. 1962 was when kind of the first papers were starting to be published about it. So we're having a shift in what people are really kind of thinking is important. And we might think of that as good if we're thinking about conservation. We would like nice to be able to do something that looked at actually action as well. And if anyone has an idea why you get the blip at the end, um, I'd be really interested. Um, I did this for this talk. I asked a librarian friend of mine. Uh, they 
made a suggestion. I ran this through a couple other search engines, and I got the same blip no matter what. And I don't know what that could be. What do you mean the, the yeah, this part. You know why we would get uh, such fluctuations uh, near the last couple of years, whereas it wasn't before. I'm kind of wondering if it's something meaningful. I'll wait a year and see if we can fake find out. I thought it might be an artifact of the search, or you know, how they were indexing things, putting papers on. But I mean, there were blips before, right? Is it a st statistically significant blip? I haven't looked at it yet. It might be the magnitude blip, it's just because it's such a, uh, now become a high value. But you haven't really had big blips there, right? so I don't know. It's something, yeah, it is you know, really, I don't know why yet, but it's kind of something new. So I wanted to, I like to put things in um, kind of impact to kind of what, particularly the public. And one nice thing about primates is they're often, you know, cute kind of the animals and people are interested in them. Uh, so if you wanted to kind of put these uh, uh, model deforestation into kind of real animal terms. Uh, since 2000, basically the area of tropical loss would have supported about 15 million primates. So that's really what we've caused the death of in human actions. So 15 million primates have died because of uh, our actions. And to give you a little bit more kind of background, this does not include the amount of area logged, because logging is not considered deforestation. Deforestation is when you have about less than 10% uh, standing of the trees because then it's actually, there's nothing left. Deforestation, logging takes about 50% of the canopy off. Belt. And so this is in uh, Congo, just across the border from where I work, uh, and you see this sort of situation really quite extensively. And statistics, kind of hard to determine, but something like uh, 6 million hectares of tropical forest are logged each year. And just to kind of make a statement, I think we know very little about forest regeneration. And another kind of thing that shows kind of our shifting ideas, at least, is in the 1950s and 60s, people made very clear statements about particularly when you could go back and log an area. And basically the idea was that if you give a period of time for the forest to regenerate, the animals will follow the forest, and basically in 30 to 50 years you'll be able to re-log the forest. At that time the trees will have grown back, the monkeys will have come back to the forest. Um, in Kibali, where I work, the log forest and their primate populations have not recovered 50 years after logging. And they said we could go back in 30 years. So our expectations based on science were, were really quite erroneous. They were wrong. And the reasons they were wrong probably is they didn't take into account um, the animals sitting there, which are elephants. Elephants like logged areas. They come in and they forage in logged areas. And elephants can destroy the forest when they do a lot of foraging. So they basically come into those areas and preferentially feed there, causing the damage. Well, kind of one of the last things, that, or two, two last things that are kind of happening with primates that we don't think about a lot is bushmeat trays. So this is the back of a pickup truck in Congo, and you can see basically mandrills, pangolins, uh, porcupines. These are animals that have all been hunted. Uh, this is an image of a female chimpanzee that was shot, and she's going to go into basically the cooking uh, pot in the evening for the, for the group, and all the kids are gathering around because I wanted to take a picture, and as soon as I did that, they wanted to be in the picture. Um, in terms of local markets, you often find images like this. These are animals that have been, uh, basically, they've uh, been smoked. You smoke the animals, smoke the monkeys in this case, be able to transport them long distances. So you might hunt them 20, 30 kilometers into the forest. You then smoke them, and you can carry out the smoked meat rather than live, uh, fresh meat. One of the biggest problems is snare hunting. Uh, it's a, uh, basically a problem in all areas of Africa. This is a snare that's being taken apart, but the snare is typically a wire that's uh, 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 strung on a kind of a, a trip uh, branch, and then an animal comes along, steps in it. If the animal's small enough, it's basically left there hanging until the poacher comes along and kills it. If the animal is, is bigger, uh, such as a chimpanzee, they basically can pull the wire from its support, but they end up with a wire uh, tats around the wrist the wire is metal, so it'll start rusting. If it rusts, uh, it'll cause infection. And this animal has uh, lost its uh, hand at the wrist, and uh, it's kind of the damage kind of thing. Uh, about 30% of some populations are missing limbs, uh, so it's a really high incidence. There's a male in our community now that lost uh, both of his 
um, basically both of his feet. He still can climb, it's amazing, but uh, there's quite a lot of damage. And we know very little about uh, bushmeat. Uh, we know some things from surveys and in markets about the extent, but we know very little about it in terms of kind of the human dimension or even what it's doing to most populations. Because biologists typically go to populations where they can study it. If a population is being hunted, you can't study it. So uh, it's kind of uh, a big lack of data. Um, <clears throat> so we have little data, so I tried to kind of uh, get whatever I could. A friend of mine uh, who's Brazilian, who uh, actually is in uh, England, he calculated the amount of uh, bush meat that's coming out of the Congo, and he thinks something like 4 million uh, primates are consumed annually in the Amazon. And what we did is we put this into kind of, uh, kind of uh, a market value, and so this has a market value of 42 million. Why we put it into the market value is because the idea that he really uh, kind of advocated for is if we're going to tell the local people, well, you can't hunt monkeys, then we have to provide them alternatives. So this is the amount uh, it would cost simply per kilogram if you basically provided people with cattle meat. And it's kind of ironic to make that calculation because the, Congo, uh, the Amazon basin is being cut down a lot for the formation of cattle ranches. But we have to think about it there. The other thing kind of to emphasize is that it's not just a problem with the tropics. Uh, bushmeat is uh, fairly international. And basically, the weight of bushmeat confiscated at Charles de Gaulle Airport uh, each year is equal to about uh, 570 cows being brought through the airport. So, this is what's confiscated out of people's uh, luggage. So, each person is carrying in a small little package, and this is the amount of weight that's, that's confiscated that way. I don't know how much is not caught. It's probably considerable amounts. I don't know how much comes in through things like uh, boats, etc. The last thing that we've been thinking about uh, in kind of my field uh, lately, probably the last 10, 15 years, that's all, is uh, diseases. And you've probably heard a lot about things like Ebola. Uh, Ebola affects people and causes dramatic you know, mass mortalities in the areas that it's occurred. Uh, you probably haven't heard about probably two-thirds of the epidemics that break out, you probably never hear, well, you never hear about because they don't actually hit the, hit the press. But there have been a number of uh, outbreaks that basically people don't even know about. And we know about the, what it can do to human populations, or its potential, but we don't know what it can do to animal populations. We know that animals like chimpanzees and gorillas, uh, can basically, if they get Ebola, they die just like humans do. Uh, there's almost no studies that have looked at it, uh, because there's very few studies where we actually know density uh, of great apes or most monkeys. But in one study, they basically show that Ebola is related to population declines so of chimpanzees' populations by 89% and gorillas by 56%. So these are diseases that people can get and uh, monkeys can get, and we're basically possibly encouraging the transmission uh, in that way. Also, kind of want to emphasize that. This is changing dramatically. It's changing much more rapidly than kind of the academic community can realize. This actually came out, uh, well, sometime this last month. I basically found it yesterday, so this is kind of fresh. It's actually doing too bad, kind of, kind of pasting off Facebook. Uh, so this is, uh, is a World Bank, so it should be somewhat actively accurate. This is just kind of uh, basically change in forest areas. And you know, what I'd like to kind of point out is, you know, we see a lot of things that we might think about which is kind of the pink areas that we know are being kind of lost. But it's also interesting to see the uh, green areas. So one thing I did know about was that China is changing dramatically, and China is reforesting really quickly. And so there's huge conservation potential for people to work in China and basically uh, have a positive impact. So that's something we're interested in. So things are changing, and they're changing really rapidly, and uh, our policies and our, even our knowledge are not really keeping up with what's happening. Canada didn't do so well. No, <laughs> I know, I was kind of surprised at that too. Does it include planting forests? Uh, I don't know, actually. Probably. I Does guess. It, does it include what kind of forest? Planting. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Because there is all these upset schemes yeah. that can make yeah. some gains yeah. which are not ecologically so bad. No. So it's palm oil plantations, it would not be, if it's, some plantations are not that bad. No. So, um, Eucalyptus and pine, a lot of monkeys actually use them if they have uh, kind of uh, other sorts of plants growing in them. So, yeah, 
it's not quite sure how you should even think about those. So a little bit kind of on my research. So I'm really interested in change. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to be able to uh, document change, but I don't just want to be able to document change. I want to basically be able to understand change. And if I can understand the drivers of change and how primates or forests respond to those changes, I want to be able to predict it. And the idea is being able to predict it. If I can predict it, I can basically say, this is going to happen if we don't change our policies or we don't change our attitudes or what we're doing. So we have to do something now so this doesn't occur. So that's, I think that's what really conservation biology has some use in some senses rather than just saying, well, look at what happened in the past. We can really say, well, this is going to happen if we don't change something. So that's really what I'm interested in. And the perspective I've taken really is to work in one area to try to understand that one area. And the area I work in is called Kibale National Park. I've been working in this since 1989, and that's in kind of the western side of Uganda on the foothills of the Ruinsori Mountains. It's also a really beautiful place to work. It's at a high kind of elevation, so it's a, a nice place to just kind of spend your summers. So I'm interested in change. Um, and uh, one thing we've looked at, I'll just kind of run through about four or five things we've looked at. We looked at change in forest composition. So we had a number of forest plots throughout the area. We identified all the trees. We have been looking at what the primates are eating. And this is just an example of one change that's occurred. Primates love to eat flowers. So this is a black and white colobus eating one of the flowers of one of their favorite trees. And if you eat the flowers on a tree, basically you're eating the reproductive organs. If they eat the flower, they don't pollinate. If they don't pollinate, they can't set fruit. And what we noticed um, was simply that uh, if you went into the forest, some of these trees were not setting fruit. And I just thought it was a natural thing to occur. And then I went into the village and I was talking to friends and I was sitting under a tree, literally, and I saw all these fruits and I said, what are these things? And they said, Marcamia. And they kind of looked at me like I you know, didn't know what it was. And Marcamia, uh, I've never seen fruiting. It's fruiting uh, very frequently uh, in the villages, but not in the forest. So what we kind of thought is what's happening is the monkeys are basically eating on the flowers, so the plant is setting fruit. We uh, looked at what the distribution of Marcamia is. This is the number of trees. This is basically size. DBH means diameter and breast height. And what you see is basically Marcamia is uh, slowly but surely uh, dying out and it's not being replaced. So the forest is changing because of the monkey's foraging behavior. I'm also really interested in elephants for the last probably four or five years only. And in Kibale, elephant density is increasing. I want to be really clear, throughout Africa, elephants are being decimated. So the numbers are going down dramatically, the range is uh, shrinking. But in Kibale, the numbers are going up. And so this is uh, just some data from the 1990s to uh, about two years ago. And basically, kind of first kind of uh, 15 years, I kind of saw the numbers slowly, surely get going up. And I thought, great, the ant populations are recovering. This is really good, positive. And then they kind of skyrocketed, and I thought, Okay, well, I did something wrong. I looked whether or not it's possible if every single, if the population was about three quarters of females and every female had population at birth, could they make that leap? They couldn't. So I thought I must have done something wrong. The only other explanation was that the animals had moved in from somewhere. And I didn't think that's possible because Kibale is surrounded by agricultural land. But uh, I had a friend from, who was a postdoc with me at Harvard when I was there, and he's now at Wisconsin. He does elephant genetics, so I said I could you know, basically uh, get hold of my old friend and send him uh, samples from elephants to get samples from elephants used to collect elephant dung. So I sent him samples, and basically, lo and behold, the animals that it had moved in, and they came from Congo. So probably in the early 90s, when there was uh, kind of around the time of the Rwandan genocide and just after, uh, elephants probably moved in because they were basically being persecuted in Congo. They left Congo and moved into Uganda. And I actually uh, uh, talked to my Ugandan colleagues and they told me about a PhD student who had actually seen 300 elephants crossing a river. Uh, so I went back and found the unpublished PhD and uh, kind of figured out that that's probably what happened. So they moved out to Uganda. Well, that sounds good from an elephant conservation perspective. Well, elephants uh, are very destructive foragers. They eat the bark off the trees. If they eat the bark off the tree, they kill the tree. 
And so elephants can actually drive a forest from being forest towards being grassland. So I'm really concerned what they're going to do in terms of kind of the structure of the forest. I, I study primates, I like primates, so uh, basically if there's no trees, there's no primates. So I was kind of wanting to figure out what's going to happen in the next decade. I'm also concerned about kind of conservation issues. And to have conservation going forward, you have to have kind of cooperation with local people. And between 2006 and 2012, the area damaged by wildlife increased 30 times, with 60% of the local farmers within a kilometer of the park being affected. So the local people are really getting affected by particularly elephants leaving the park. <clears throat> if we're looking at change, we basically have to think about climate change. These are kind of typical statistics. The Earth has been warming relatively slowly. Kibali, uh, we have data since the turn of the century, and it's actually changing quite rapidly. There is now 300 millimeters more rain per year than at the start of the century. And this is the data from Kibali. And it's pretty clear there's been a kind of pretty, pretty linear uh, uh, trend in increasing rainfall. Some of those oscillations relate perfectly to El Nino events and around that. So we're getting a wetter climate. We're also getting less frequent droughts, an earlier onset of the rainy season, and there's a, been a 4.4 increase in the average monthly uh, temperatures. So we're kind of a, a hot spot, pardon the pun, of climate change in the area. Um, so I was interested, what could this be causing? Uh, and I didn't plan this study, but uh, there's a number of uh, publications in the literature that illustrate that if you change the climate, you change the actual composition of plants. So these are all done, these are predictions coming out of uh, greenhouse experiments. And in the greenhouse, you basically increase the temperature, you can increase the rainfall by watering the plant more, or you can seal the greenhouse and basically uh, put it at a higher level of CO2. And just, you just got to look at the first line. Basically, you're going to decrease, with each of those changes in climate, you're going to decrease the amount of protein. So what I did is I went back and uh, compared what the leaves uh, are kind of now to what they were before and basically their leaves have lower levels of protein and I can explain that to you in detail but that's the punchline. Leaves are basically have lower quality protein than did you know uh, 30 years ago, 10 years ago uh, so uh, the food is getting poorer for the animals. But don't you have more leaves because of the rain? No, because yeah. uh, trees are kind of limited to what they actually can put on. And the monkeys actually only eat the young leaves too, which are the ones that are, have more protein. Um, we can look at uh, kind of monkeys and climate change in terms of disease. There's lots of diseases that are affected by climate. So uh, if you have increased rainfall, you have more standing water, you tend to have more malaria. Increasing rainfall, you get more runoff, you get a lot, all sorts of increase in gastrointestinal parasites. So let's give you uh, two examples. Um, it's really hard to study climate change because you need to have uh, studies done 30 years ago uh, or more. And so this was a study done in 1959 by a guy called Bill Freeland. He studied the protozoans that are found in the primates. So things like Giardia or Canada, we call it beaver fever or Rocky Mountain House fever. Um, it's a, basically a Giardia. It's a type of protozoan that, that you get from water. And these are uh, data uh, that compares 1979 to 2009. Uh, a number of monkey species, and all I really want you to notice are the two colas. So these are both leaf-eating monkeys, and in the earlier studies, they didn't have any protozoans. They basically didn't have this type of uh, parasites, and now they do. So it's uh, tempting to suggest that this might be caused by uh, climate change. We do, however, know that people are increasingly coming into contact with primates, and that this can lead to transmission. We share a lot of diseases with primates. Uh, I can kind of go through lots of them, you know, AIDS, uh, Ebola, uh, tuberculosis, yellow fever, a uh, number of par parasites like Giardia. So things like Ebola we're, we're uh, really concerned with about transmission. I must admit I'm too, I like my life too much to study Ebola. Uh, it's much too hard so I, we weren't interested in looking at Ebola. So what we did is we studied E. coli. Um, right now all of you have E. coli. Um, Basically, it's found in all of our stomachs. It only becomes a problem. It comes at acute levels. All mammals have it. All birds have it. Uh, what happens over time is uh, the type of E. coli just kind of diverge slightly genetically, 
uh, by just being separated for a period of time. Just by random mutation, they separate. So what we did is we basically studied the E. coli in red colobus, black and white colobus in humans. And this is a, a genetic tree, you can think about it as a family tree. And all of what it's really show you is that they're quite mixed over, over time. So basically, or between the species. So uh, the people have red colobus E. coli, uh, red colobus have people E. coli. So what probably happens is you defecate in this forest, runs off to the water, you get the water, and you basically share an E. coli. I'm really lucky to be able to have some data from a researcher called Tom Stusaker who worked from 1970 to 1987. I started in 89. And in the mid-90s, Tom said, would you like my data? And I said, sure. And he shipped me up about you know, 14 boxes of data to be entered. So I entered the data. What well, allows me to go back further in time. And just really quickly, this shows kind of the population density from 1970 to 2020. Well, no, 2020 to last year. Uh, and more or less the populations of red colobus, black and white colobus, and red tail monkeys are stable. Blue monkeys are declining and mangroves are increasing. So that's kind of what's actually happening. And we can look at kind of predicted by these things that I was just talking about, things like uh, forest change, uh, uh, climate change, etc., versus what we observed. So there's negative climate change bringing about negative consequences, the food is less nutritious. There's more natural diseases and then more diseases from humans. So all those should be negative towards the primates. And what we have happening basically is the primate populations are stable or increasing, with the one exception of blue monkeys, which I can explain. So in other words, you know, basically 20 some 28 years of research, and I can't predict what's actually happening. So it's I found it interesting. I wasn't really disappointed by it, but it just means I have to do another 20 some odd years of research. So, just kind of moving on to what can be done, and then kind of my points. Uh, we have to think about enforcement. We can think about science. So I looked at things like nutrition, so I can predict uh, the biomass of the colobus. So the colobus monkeys are in an area by the quality of their food. And we can use that sort of information. So what uh, we did, and this is basically kind of very fortunate, is about 140 square kilometers of Kibali was degraded, that's the unfortunate part, uh, and <clears throat> uh, they were basically putting in a, a carbon offset project, and so they basically came into the area and said, well, what do we plant? So I suggested, well, plant foods that are good for these primates, and they, uh, they uh, did that at the time, and so the primate populations in this area are really quite skyrocketing. The area that was deforested would have supported about 260 chimpanzees, and I'll kind of revisit that number in a minute. We suggested it was used in logging operations. Uh, so far it hasn't been, but hopefully it might be taken up. This brings up uh, kind of the issue of kind of individuals versus populations. Uh, so I showed you basically protecting that 160 square kilometers that was deforested would have saved 260 uh, chimpanzees. Huge amount of money is spent on the individual level. So Jane Goodall Institute uh, particularly uh, works on protecting individuals so in this case, these are two chimpanzees that are being exported to the former Yugoslavia. Uh, they're worth about $10,000 each. So do we try to protect those two individual chimpanzees or do we try to protect populations? And that's kind of a dilemma that conservation agencies are facing and there's lots of arguments between different people trying to figure out how you allocate funding. Another thing we can do is training. This is a colleague of mine in Mexico. We've been very successful at kind of making training. Uh, he's got a city that's declared itself kind of the uh, capital of the howler monkey, and there's a, a yearly uh, fiesta uh, for just howler monkeys. I think his success has been that he's got money for parties, and that people really like having parties, and so he's got conservation money going to parties. But it's also led to reforestation efforts and all sorts of kind of very positive things. Academics, we do things like training. Uh, the person at the bottom is my PhD student. He went on to become the head of national parks. We do things at McGill, like uh, basically take the students over to Africa. These do two things. motivates a whole group of, kind of students that are probably the next generation that are going to hopefully do conservation. We can work on, with groups like National Geographic. They do kind of lots of uh, different sorts of exposure of people to conservation ideas. 
Uh, we, uh, at academics, we basically promote field stations. Field stations, this is a kind of an economic uh, assessment of how far money goes out from the field station. So it goes out quite a, quite a ways. And in effect, the field station basically pays directly or indirectly about 700 people a month. So this is kind of a trickle-down effect. So, and lastly, we can work with communities. Uh, and this is where I put a lot of my effort lately. So this is Joseph Berhanga, his third wife and his children. Uh, he's the local kind of tribal leader. Uh, and Joseph is not rich, as you can kind of see by his, uh, kind of his house. It's probably Joseph who is setting these snares. And it's definitely Joseph's children who are going in and collecting firewood. So they're the ones doing what we might consider to be negative actions against the park. So we can work with uh, those people in those communities to kind of somehow help them with the idea that if we help them, they'll do less negative actions. One thing we've done is uh, ecotourism, so we set up the chimpanzee ecotourism in Kibale. The one thing I'm really interested in is basically providing health uh, benefits to local people. And the idea is you can provide health benefits and then you can't give money to lots of people, but you can provide health benefits. And if you save a ch person's child's life, the parents hopefully will be kind of grateful to you for a long period of time. Life expectancy in Uganda is 45 years. 26% of the children under the age of 5 are malnourished. 30% of the deaths among children between the years, ages of 2 and 4 are caused by malaria. That can easily be prevented uh, or treated. And there's lots of kind of gastrointestinal parasites. And the average distance is about 12, uh, 10 kilometers. And this is a woman getting on the back of the bicycle, uh, basically to ride with her husband, and she's actually in labor. Uh, she's had difficulty giving birth, so you don't normally go to the hospital unless you have difficulties. So she's about to ride 10 kilometers on the back of that bicycle to get to the hospital. We didn't take her in since I drove by in my four-wheel drive truck, so we did uh, take her to the hospital. So the idea was, could we help the local community meet their health needs? So uh, what we did is this idea really came from just talking to one of the field assistants that I work with, walking back one day after kind of watching chimpanzees all day. We were way away from camp, and we were just walking back and chatting about what we need. So we uh, held a lot of benefit dinners, raised uh, money from uh, uh, parents primarily uh, around McGill. We built the clinic, hired a nurse, and we opened the uh, clinic in Kibali. You'll see a lot of students around this picture. Those students raised the money to make it sustainable. So every year they raised most of the money to basically pay for the nurse's salary. And we started a mobile clinic that now travels around the park. And that's a Montreal ambulance that we shipped over. So, kind of, uh, kind of summing up kind of the ideas I kind of think, want to think about, so kind of food for thought, the world is changing and changing rapidly. And, you know, science is not be able to kind of even document those changes fast enough and we can't predict the changes as of yet. We have shifting baselines occurring and I think that's something that I'm quite concerned about because, you know, if we shift our baselines every uh, decade or basically every decade, uh, then how do we actually know what we want to uh, actually should be conserving? There's a big issue with my, in my perspective in conserving biodiversity, so in my case conserving primates in the forest or working on ha uh, human welfare. And that's also a associated with shifting kind of uh, baselines. A, a generation ago they were basically saying, well we have to just preserve biodiversity. Now we're saying we have to preserve biodiversity, but we have to meet human needs. I think it's slowly but surely shifting, at least right now, towards helping local populations more. Uh, whether that's good or bad, or whether mutually exclusive, is something that I think we should be addressing, and we're not addressing it. Uh, I think one of those reasons is most people, individuals doing conservation, are biologists. They've never had probably a philosophy course in their life. They don't uh, fill out human ethic forms because they um, don't really think they're actually dealing with people, they're dealing with conservation. There's lots of different issues that are kind of there. There's the question of, is it worth saving individuals like chimpanzees? Do we work on the individual level, population level? Uh, what should academics do? So, you know, basically, if you're uh, younger and untenured, you basically should publish papers, get grants, you shouldn't be doing things like the mobile clinic and the health efforts that I do. 
Uh, McGill often kind of you know basically uh, puts me towards media or that sort of thing, saying, "Look what McGill's doing," but they don't. I, you know, they don't really care at all that I'm doing that, and it never goes into my merit pay. I think they kind of find it kind of, kind of interesting, but it's not really what an academic does. There's been an argument uh, in my department about whether or not we should be advocating at all or doing anything like what I'm doing. Uh, I have tenure, so I don't have to listen to them, but um, <laughs> it's something I'm really interested in. I'd like to see it change. But So those are kind of the take-home messages and kind of the five points I just uh, mentioned. And those are things that I think, um, I think personally from my experience, we should be thinking about that we're not really thinking about. Uh, and so it's kind of uh, something that basically we need more attention to. And I'm just going to end with the 1962 quote. Uh, and I basically, you know, kind of end with can we remain unmoved by such annihilation, which is kind of something that was interesting seeing that it was said in 1962. Thank you, Colin. Questions? There's still a lot of wine as well. Um, thank you for the talk, Colin. So I've just got two questions. Um, the first is I'm interested in the perceived conflict between the elephants, the primates, and the humans. And I guess like, towards the end, you were sort of talking about how you engage with like human communities. Um, but I was wondering like, what kinds of communication there is between, what efforts there are between humans and the elephant population, if you're concerned about the damage that the elephant populations do. So that was just uh, the first question. The second one, so you, you're also worried about this idea of shifting baselines, um, and I guess I, I was not sure whether you were, there was some kind of static sense that like some point back in time, that was the thing that we should be aspiring to. So any change was like a bad thing, like any shift in the baseline. And so I guess like I'm just curious about where the appropriate baseline should be. Right. It seems like a static baseline isn't going to be right, because some change surely must be fine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, um, well, let me ask, ask, go for the first one, yeah. uh, the second question first, actually. I don't know what, what the baseline should be. Um, I just know that we shouldn't be uh, kind of changing it because, oh, we have satellite images, so let's use that as a baseline. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we should, be, we should be making a decision what should be the baseline. So something uh, that I've just done is I've got the game department records since 1922 about what, how they've been dealing with elephant problems. Uh, and so I want to just kind of talk about the idea of, well, in 1922, elephants were basically running through uh, some of the neighboring towns. You know, they were really a big problem. They started basically killing about a thousand a year uh, in the 1920s and 30s. So, you know, basically just kind of giving a perspective that we should be thinking about what the baseline is. I don't know what the right baseline is, but we need to think about it. Um, and why I think we need to think about it is because, you know, Areas like Kibale, if, it, if the animals are actually changing numbers, we're going to have to do something about it. If Kibale, the animals are above what the forest can take, we're going to have to start uh, doing something about elephant numbers. What do you do about elephant numbers? Uh, be, you know, we couldn't kill them because that would be uh, considered you know, inappropriate. Uh, you know, ideas about giving birth control might be suggested. But have you ever tried to basically walk up to an elephant and shoot it? in the forest. Um, I was standing for about five minutes beside an elephant that was literally 14 meters away from me uh, and I couldn't see it until it charged. Um, and you know, they're amazingly hard to see inside a forest. So you know, we have to do something, but we need to know what the baseline is and I don't know what the baseline should be. But uh, you know, I think that's really what we've got to start kind of the conversation on. With respect to kind of the human population and elephants, uh, uh, the local community does not like elephants. You know, I kind of say uh, that elephants are kind of interesting animals, and they look at me, and, you know, that I'm, you know, kind of from another planet. When I first went to Uganda, I kind of they would ask me why should they like the park, and I would say because it provides rain, it provides nutrients coming from the park. It's good because you're, you know, conserving all these things, and they would nod and be very polite to me. And after a while, I gave up saying that. I just said, I like monkeys. And then they seemed to totally understand what I was meaning, which is the real reason I think I like they the park. Eat them, no? Pardon? They eat them. Not in our area. 
if they ate them in our area, if they ate them, I couldn't be studying there. So they hate the elephants, um, and there have been some uh, retribution killing. So they have basically killed a few elephants that have moved into their crops, uh, which of course would be uh, is negative if they get caught doing that. They're in serious trouble. Um, so there's all sorts of conflict like that. They have, however, turned in armed poachers. So uh, a group of four poachers came in with semi-automatic rifles, uh, and they obviously were going in for killing elephants. And the community basically reported those people to the local uh, the park services. The, it was quite interesting because what they did is they reported them, and then in, a, in the middle of the night, the whole community left. Basically, they left the village. So in the morning, the, the army came in with the park services, and there's no one there except for the four poachers. But they actually put themselves at considerable risk to do that. Uh, but you know, it's it's a conflict, and I don't know how to kind of, uh, answer. But it, I guess it seems like you're not that keen on the elephants either. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Being, yeah. being a monkey man. So I guess like, I'm just kind of curious about the elephants seem to be there; they're there to stay, right? And they yeah. someone can dissuade them, and then it doesn't even seem. Right, that they're dissuaded and are they just going to be pushed back into areas where they're endangered? So, like, how I guess, like, I'm asking what kinds of plan, what kind of plan is on the table for managing like the relationships between the elephants, the primates, you, and the, <laughs> and the rest of the humans who are living there? There isn't a plan, uh, and there's no ideas of what to do. So, what I want to do in my research is provide options and okay. say what's happening at least, because if we know what's happening, we can make a plan. So I'm working with the local community to figure out how much they hate elephants. We're working on mechanisms to try to get move elephants away from crops. So we're going to bait them into the park, actually. Is our new idea to try to figure out what they're doing to the forest. But, you know, I gather the information. That's what I see as my job. But then other people have to, uh, I'll interpret it and say what could be happening in the future. And then somebody else has to set the policy. So, but, you know. We're not having those discussions yet, so, and I think when we'll have those discussions is when it's too late to collect any information on the situation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you very much for this talk. Um, I would have done different things to say, but just to begin with the shifting baseline issue. Uh, you've mentioned the importance of uh, science and scientists uh, in the general issue, but I think that in order to avoid this shifting baseline syndrome, a kind of epistemic revolution has to be done inside science, and especially inside conservation, biology, and ecology, because the kind of data that could help uh, to avoid this syndrome are heterogeneous, unsure, long time past data, which has nothing to do with what uh, contemporary ecologists are used to and want to work with. So for instance, even you have used these uh, um, schemes of the, uh, the amount of publishing and this, and today at some point I guess I wonder whether uh, the data predeterminate the reality. So maybe almost each big mammal in Africa is bandied and yeah. monitored, and yeah. that is the reality. So if you think, for instance, about elephants or primates 100 years ago, you have to rely on very different kinds of data, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, this uh, trip, exotic trips of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, Western uh, um, discoveries, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it's just, uh, I think science has to do something, but in order to do that, especially for the shift in baseline syndrome, science has to reform itself and to be, um, to welcome very yeah. different kinds of data, and maybe put data uh, to be a little less fetishist about data. Yeah. It's just the first comment about the, the place of science, but the place for maybe a kind of new science. You know, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we don't have nice quantitative data from 1920s, so we have to use stories and you know odd little reports and that sort of thing. And um, ecologists aren't willing to accept it. 
I had a one of my papers I just had rejected was a yeah, journals doesn't want no. I had a basically the study from you know 1989 to present on uh, fruiting patterns in trees. Uh, I submitted it to a, a good journal to Ecology, and they rejected it because it wasn't experimental. So you know, how do you make an experimental project over 20 some odd years? How do you make an experimental project with tropical trees to start with? Like I could just see me. Uh, trying to pump water to water trees. You know, it's just a totally ridiculous reason for rejecting it. And it's actually rejected twice now for those sorts of reasons. Um, but yes, I think science is very narrow in what it'll accept, and it's getting narrower in my opinion. Narrower. Yeah. And maybe I can have time come back on the elephants issue. Steve, question? Yeah. Actually, I'm just wondering. Um, Long term, do you think there's more success to be had um, in having some sort of outreach and education programs to local populations such that they can live near protected areas and be able to, because of a shared understanding of the impacts of human interventions, sort of mm -hmm. hold back, you know, cooperate more? Uh, you know, where what are the diminishing returns on that versus saying long term, really, we just need to stake out areas and say, here's half a billion dollars to locate, or like, yeah. where, how far do you think we can get in terms of creating sustainable levels of uh, human intervention with sort of stable mm -hmm. settlements? Right? It would be interesting to see how many of your questions I can answer by starting off with, I don't know. <laughs> um, That's good, sir. Yeah, it would be nice to be able to say, okay, we're going to set off this area, and just, you know, no one can come in. So we'd put guards up and you know, arrest anyone that came by and had, you know, if it was a uh, hundred square kilometers, we'd have, you know, a few million, ten million dollars a year to spend on it. We don't have that, so that's not an option. I'm not sure, you know, if the local population is, you know, very much, you know, starving or going basically into the park just to get fuel wood. Is it right to say that or not? I don't know. Um, you know. I think education is really important um, because if, you, if we talk to the local people, which very few biologists do, so when I first got there, they basically thought that people, white people were in the park to uh, mine for gold. They were certain we were there mining for gold. Um, and you know, that's, someone had been there for 17 years before me and they thought he was getting rich by getting gold. But if you talk to the local people and you ask them you know, about the forest, they like it. They think it's interesting. They hate the elephants, of course, but they like the forest. And if we can encourage the next generation to like the forest, I think that's going to be positive. There's no data to show that. Um, and, you know, it, I, can't, I can't probably write or publish a paper on the fact that people like the forest. They tell me these sorts of ideas. Uh, but I think that's kind of, that's my opinion. So I don't know. But again, we don't really know. Can you maybe follow up on this? I mean, you know, for someone who's not in the field, but I'd heard about Kibali National Park before. Right? So then it, it seems to me that a local population who lives near one of those places that are really on the map in terms of conservation efforts is probably more sensitive to these issues than elsewhere. Right? And if this population has been thinking that you're in there to dig for gold, Yep. And I imagine, well, in probably in most conservation efforts in Africa or anywhere else, um, the attitude towards the, convers towards the uh, conservation by the local population is probably not that much in favor. No. Yeah. Uh, so that, that probably, to me, would seem to be the biggest challenge in terms of moving forward. Right? I mean, what, what could be avenues? I mean, you, you seem to have chosen one, and that is you know, helping the community in other ways and you know, building, uh, building bridges and through a feeling of solidarity. Uh, That's the idea. Yeah. Um, are there other ways to promote this kind of, you know, start with awareness, not even necessarily uh, yeah. engagement? In, you know, I think, you know, education, awareness, outreach are really important. And, you know, Kibali is well known. It makes quite a bit of money from chimpanzee to ecotourism now. Um, you know, we've been operating, you know, outreach. We've set up schools. There's now five schools that have been set up by researchers. 
there's all sorts of things happening. If you go about 30 kilometers to the north or south of the field station, uh, they don't know almost anything. If you go to the back of the park, which is, takes you two hours to drive, uh, they still think it's a forest reserve. It was made a national park in 1993. So there's very little awareness. So yeah, I think you know, increasing awareness, increasing kind of uh, understanding is really key. But again, you know, uh, there's very little emphasis put on that. Uh, yeah, so I don't know how to kind of change the awareness or how to increase things. The mobile clinic was an idea to do that because it's a, um, a traveling um, incentive basically. It can go all the way around the park. And how the, I envisioned it being very, um, you know, I made a set schedule. You go here on Tuesday, here on Wednesday, and you know, you set up and provide the services. What the park service did, which was totally much better than I did, I thought of, is they basically, they never can keep on schedule because the truck breaks down or someone has to use it for something else, so it never keeps on. They phone up and say, we're going to come tomorrow. And so the guy runs around and spreads the word. They come to whatever village they're going to, they put the sirens on as they approach, so it's blaring sirens, they're honking the horn as they come up. They jump out of the, the, the ambulance, they set up these giant speakers they bought that you're like standing on that tall, uh, and they start playing, you know, uh, very loud music, the kids come running from all around, and they started this big party. Uh, yeah, I didn't write that into the grants at all. Uh, but it's much more successful than what I thought. <laughs> Most of my conservation projects, you know, I start off with these nice ideas, and they totally make it much more appropriate. What about efforts at the level of the state that would be more general, where you could have some impact uh, that is uh, all over the country? Yeah, again, uh, that's something that would be really good. You know, I don't know how to do it that well. Um, you know, I don't know how to kind of talk to governments, etc. Uh, I work with national parks, and the parks talk to the governments, so I think that works somewhat okay. We need to do it a lot more. One thing, one thought I had uh, fairly recently is, you know, we always talk about ecotourism, and everyone evaluates ecotourism about how much money goes to the local community, the people within 10 kilometers. In reality, I think probably the biggest advantage of things like chimpanzee, particularly gorilla ecotourism, is the government loves it. Because the government basically sees Uganda plastered over all these signs and all these websites because of gorillas. So it's a very intangible kind of boost for their uh, country's status. And I don't know how to evaluate that. Elephants as well, huh? Must be Pardon? Elephants must be attractive for tourists. Yeah, well, I think uh, <laughs> So, um, kind of off the back of Peter's question, and it's not really a question so much, I mean, there's obviously so many different intersecting issues here, but I guess I was <laughs> just thinking about like, climate change and deforestation. What about just like global capitalism or something along those lines? It seems like that's one of the main, major driving forces, at least in its current incarnation, for why there's so, much, <laughs> so many problems. And it's, you know, much less to do with... Uh, Local populations. I mean, obviously, then then there's the question of intersecting issues, different things in different places. But <laughs> I don't know. So I guess that's more of a statement than a question. But I mean, are you sympathetic to that idea? It seems like that's going to be one of the. Yeah, I definitely think that yeah. is really important, and yeah, really, you know, it's a totally different perspective to think of. But um, again, we're just not dealing with it. Yeah. Um, in many ways, I think I'm, I'm working in this little park. Yeah, you know, it's 800 square kilometers almost, but yeah, you know, that's why that's where I've had an impact, and uh, you know, there's so many things I'm just not doing. I don't know how to do. One thing I, I kind of emphasize is that you know, uh, I'm trained in anthropology and uh, biology, so I have a joint PhD and then two postdocs, one in each. Uh, so I have a little bit of anthropological training. Um, don't tell my colleagues that I said a little bit. Uh, I'm a biological anthropologist. You know, I have no training in kind of dealing with people. I have no training in interviews. I have no formal training in thinking about ethics. I have no formal training in all these other sorts of fields. But there's no one there doing it. I'm doing tons of health work now. And I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I work with Ugandan doctors. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure I could benefit a lot by you know, McGill's giant medical school. Somebody helping. Um, but you know, it's usually just uh, somebody from a very small background. And the question, doesn't Yeah, my, my question kind of to the, is going in the same line. Uh, I don't know for Africa, but for instance, in Southeast Asia, tropical forests are mainly uh, threatened by um, the palm oil yeah. 
trees, plantation, and even in Africa, I know that ivory poaching is um, a nightmare, and it's a nightmare for instance for uh, national park guards or uh, ranchers yep. uh, uh, that can that who can be killed uh, by an international yep. mafia for ivory, but also for bushmeat because bushmeat is not only you know like uh, subsistence hunting things, but a lot of it go to the cities and even to international cities, etc. So it was just a point because while um, emphasizing on um, firewood picking and bushmeat for subsistence, maybe we have just a little picture of a big problem which lies somewhere else, especially in our demand mm -hmm. in Western societies for exotic products. Which yeah. are just unsustainable. And um, so my question was: Do you have an, a, even an approximative idea of the uh, the part of the three causes: deforestation, epidemics, and uh, bushmeat in the case of Uganda? Can you? In the case of Uganda, you know, uh, basically um, <clears throat> the biggest problem is basically very small scale people taking uh, fuel wood and they're slowly sort of eating away at parks. That's not the case right across the border, like you know, 20 kilometers away, where you know, there's armed you know, uh, teams basically with, you know, you know, equipped with $100,000 of uh, uh, machine guns, and they go in and they take elephant groups. Um, you know, we got to think of, kind of all these sorts of things. So I was just in China to find out what's happening kind of with China's conservation, because it's really changing dramatically. And I thought you know, maybe we can, you know, what I could do is I can, I'm not going to work in China, but I can basically take students and postdocs from China and that might do something to help with the training and there they're changing dramatically. This year they're basically stopping uh, the legal sale of ivory and uh, you know I was talking to the head of uh, CITES, uh, Convention for International Trade of Endangered Species in China and basically he, I said, he, he kind of, I was asking how things are going and, and, he, and I basically said, well, is this still going to work? And he said, you're really asking me, is, are people going to be moving to the black market? And he was kind of laughing at me and I kind of tried to figure out why he was laughing at me. And he said, well, in China, we basically say something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Uh, so he's, they think they'll, they'll shut down most of the illegal trade. Uh, so we have to think about those sorts of global things as well as small scale things. Uh, I don't think we can afford to ignore any of them, particularly the biggest threat probably to Ugandan forests is the government says let's log one. Uh, that's probably the biggest threat, so we have to make sure we're keeping the government happy with the ecotourism revenue and their perspectives. Uh, in terms of kind of capitalism, and kind of, you know, I drive up to these local villages to give conservation talks uh, in my $50,000 four-wheel drive vehicle. And you know, I've you know basically stopped weddings because I'm going to tell them about why the forest is important. And I feel totally hypocritical, uh, and you know it totally is. Um, but you know, I guess we have to really try to fight all these battles. And you know, I couldn't get there without a vehicle. My carbon footprint is giant because uh, I fly too much. But uh, you know, there's just so many different issues that really have to be dealt with. I really you know uh, trying to figure out where priorities should be. Set up is, is difficult. It's a big note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Continue discussion informally. Thank you very much. Great. Great.